Joe um, earned a PhD in computing at the Knowledge Media Institute of the Open University for his thesis on peer produced peer learning. He subsequently heard, held research roles at Goldsmith and the University of Edinburgh, and he's now based at Oxford Brookes University's Institute for Ethical AI as a research fellow. His research work brings AI methods together with social machines, and we're really looking forward to hearing him talk. Thank you so much. This is a report on some work that's been going on since uh, the first project. This picture, I think I can't remember I was at Edinburgh yet or not, uh, but yeah, this, this is an exciting uh, topic for me. And it's kind of a long running interest. You can see Peck is there in the, in the picture as well as one of my co-authors, Allison, and some other, other friends and uh, colleagues came along to that. So it was a, it was a lovely event uh, to go see uh, Strawberry Hill House and, and have some talks there. So um, today, um, it's a bit of a different title as well. I'm talking about making of uh, a paper rather than, or a preprint rather than um, going in detail. So there's a little bit uh, lost in La Mancha, if you're familiar with uh, Terry Gilliam's work. Um, it's kind of like that. So part one um, is gonna be a, uh, let's say succinct, but um, this is also the longest part of the talk, I think, introduction to concepts that can enable us to talk about serendipity. And the key insight is that we need to move beyond typical notions of computation to say anything about this in a computational context. Um, and I'm particularly interested in the concept of adaptivity as I'll, as I'll share with you. Um, then in part two, it's a little bit of a whirlwind tour of previous versions of this paper. And over the years, as you'll see, reviewers have had lots of valuable things to say. So we'll have a look at that. And part three is quite brief, uh, work in progress to re-outline the paper. And then I'll try to sum up the entire talk in some, some brief conclusions. So. So yeah, serendipity in a computational context. Um, so what is it? What is serendipity? So let's just look, if you type it into Google, you get to Wikipedia and they say serendipity is an unplanned, fortunate discovery. So that's, that's good enough for now. Um, why should we care? So here are some quotes that, that uh, look relevant. Why are the greatest moments and epiphanies in our lives often unexpected, serendipitous, and unplanned? That's a question, it's a kind of leading question for our purposes. Um, the explanation, this is in a certain context, uh, that you can't discover certain things by looking for them. In fact, they can only be discovered by not looking for them. Why is that another leading question? Um, let's jump right into the computation theme um, and just acknowledge it would be quite difficult to square the idea of serendipity with any model of computation that looks like this. Um, but yet, if, if you, you know, had some kind of introduction to computing, you might see something that looked like this. We have an input, a process, and an output. Um, this is a simple input-output model of computation. So if we wanted to model a process of discovery this way, then we might imagine the process part to be something like a metal detector, where you're inputting some stuff and you're, you're planning, in this case, to detect whatever metals might be in there and, and use them somehow. But I just said the key word, we're, we're planning something. So there's some degree of planning involved in this. Um, so that doesn't really square with our notion of uh, serendipity. Sorry, here, okay. Uh, well, so, okay, there's no more method for learning than there is a method for finding treasures, uh, says Gilles Deleuze. Um, so, but have a look at this at, at this diagram here um, in which this is a, a slide from um, Professor Kenneth Stanley, who I quoted above. And here on the right, he's got some images which were produced by something he called a divergent treasure hunting process. Um, and on the left, something that was produced by what he called the convergent consensus process. They're both evolutionary processes with computers and humans in the loop. But his claim was the ones on the right look just much more interesting and structured and artistic and thought provoking. So even if we don't have a method for finding treasures, we can still go about the process of looking for them and we might find something valuable. So, um, so I'm gonna try one more thing here to make this look pretty. There we go, it looks a little bit more pretty now. Um, so what about feedback? So what if we introduce that, that diagram I showed you above was actually a truncated version of the uh, of this diagram. So now we've got input process output, but we've also got memory and feedback. So we're feeding back our output in as input again. So maybe if we did this, we could uh, reliably produce some unexpected things, which is part of what we were after. So let's consider this. Uh, in fact, this is how chaos theory works. So here's a simple rule, we take x, uh, xn, and we uh, 
which is a number in this interval zero one, we take one minus that number, we multiply it by the original number times r, and that's how we define xn plus one, and we just keep at it now. Um, and this equation, of course, looks very simple. It's a quite nice equation, which should be, you know, familiar, let's say, in, in style to anyone who's done high school. Um, but in fact, this is cited as an archetypal example of how complex chaotic behavior can arise from very simple nonlinear dynamic equations. So uh, it looks simple, it produces complicated output. And here's another, another kind of process with this feedback loop. Uh, feedback as a generative process, um, this is related to the ongoing work of Stephen Wolfram and a collaborator. Um, or if you have a graph, uh, a kind of graph diagram like I, at the top, and you keep applying a rule, but you kind of apply the rule randomly to evolve the structure, you can see you get these kind of crocheted things uh, out. And, and yeah, you wouldn't necessarily know what to expect at the start. The rules are simple, but the behavior is, is complex. Um, and so all, all told, this seems to be getting us on the trail of something kind of interesting, just adding the feedback loop in. But what, let's go a little bit further because with serendipity, it's unplanned, fortunate discovery. So there's, there's quite a bit more in that. Um, what if the input process output feedback loop also transform the process itself? We could, we could think of that as learning. And so this, this gives us some difficulties because you know, if you think about learning, you might learn uh, you know, how to discriminate cats from dogs or you might learn multiplication and, and at which point you get sort of a notion of correctness, like four times four is not 17, that would be incorrect. Um, or uh, on the other hand, you might reject the notion of correctness and you go to a notion of usefulness. So what about putting the items in a museum catalog into some meaningful cluster? So here we've got painting, there we've got sculpture, here we've got things that originated in China, here we've got things that originated in Europe. And yeah, so these are some meaningful labels. Um, but if it's unsupervised, you might get any kind of set of concepts out. So here's a, here's a classic example um, of cl classifying animals, uh, those belonging to the emperor, embalmed animals, trained animals. And these categories or the categorization system doesn't have this apparent usefulness, um, you know, uh, that the other one I, I said about the museum category. That doesn't mean it's wrong. In fact, we didn't even have wrong in our lexicon when we were talking about this. It just means that we're running into some limits of what it what we can do with learning. So um, a quote from Borges in the place where he came up with this is that there's no description of the universe that isn't arbitrary and conjectural for a simple reason, we don't know what the universe is. So yeah, maybe there's someone you could ask and they could explain, oh no, this is why we use this system. But without that to hand, it's gonna be a bit hard. So here's where I'm getting into this notion of adaptivity. What if instead of just thinking about learning now, we think in terms of adaptivity and you'll see that we're gonna run into a set of limits that are very similar to the ones above. Um, but um, yeah, I think that this will, this will give some new illumination onto the things we've been talking about. So uh, what can a body do? Well, actually we get exactly the same problem with bodies that we had with the universe. Uh, no one has yet determined what the body can do, uh, either from experience of what the body can do via the laws of nature or indeed as directed by the mind, said Spinoza. So uh, bodies are practically as much a mystery to us as the universe. Um, so Deleuze uh, links Spinoza to Yuxco. Um, I won't read out that whole quote, but the idea is to relate um, things to ethology. And it says here, uh, human beings, um, no one knows ahead of time the affects one is capable of. So this is a kind of uh, serendipity in the making, I suppose, because we don't know in the future um, how how we will be affected by others, how we will affect others, how we will think about others, how we will represent to ourselves others, how we will experience things. Um, we don't really know. This is the nature of, of life in a sense. Um, he says here, it's a long affair of experimentation requiring a lasting prudence and a Spinozan wisdom um, that in his terms implies the construction of a plane of imminence or consistency. So you can see a little bit more about where this is going perhaps. Um, but let's go back to Yuxkul 1920. Here you see some nice pictures of feedback loops, but these aren't just feedback loops to steer behavior, but actually feedback on a longer scale of evolution in which the species itself is changing. And, and you could even expand that to other, other kinds of feedback loops in which the environment is changing. Um, you know, we have anthropogenic environmental change staring us right in the face every day nowadays. So um, feedback loops at this level are not simply learning, but actually shaping 
bodies and environments. Um, so let's dig a little bit more in this direction. It seems quite fruitful. Um, <clears throat> so Cole says that uh, basically to understand how organisms work in their environment, you have to understand adaptivity as a kind of correspondence. And there has to be a kind of communicative mechanism. So representing of the environment to oneself um, and potentially to other beings within the environment. Um, so let's go a little bit further. Uh, what would it mean to represent, say, oneself to oneself? Now we get something he says here, anticipation is a property which primarily appears in autocatalytic cycles. So we're now representing ourselves to ourselves. And out of this, we're finally getting this concept of anticipation, um, which in the definition of serendipity um, is, is falling down because we're, we're having unplanned discoveries, things we didn't anticipate. Um, so kind of to wrap it all up into one thing, uh, Guattari points out that um, if we think about machinic assemblages that the machines that we use constitute together with human beings, these broader systems become ipso facto autopoietic. So basically, even though machines aren't alive, they aren't self-reproducing. Self if we put them together with humans, you know, we, we build new laptops and iPhones and skyscrapers and sets of roller skates and stuff all the time. So there's something going on there. So yeah, take two, serendipity. What is it and why should we care? We've looked a little bit at the concept of serendipity through these different lenses of computation, feedback, learning, and adaptivity. Um, framing it as an unplanned fortunate discovery seems to work. Um, and actually now we're almost back at the beginning because we can now start to think about the unplanned fortunate discovery specifically of communication mechanisms. Um, and that's a good chance for me to take a little breath and, and for us to move on to part two. So part two, serendipity is unplanned fortunate discovery. Um, and this is where I'm gonna talk a bit about the, uh, the preprint. Um, so uh, I suppose I could say to my shame, this is the history of this uh, preprint modeling serendipity in a computational context of which I'm the lead author. So the good news first, it's been cited 25 times that's not a huge amount, but it's it's not an insubstantial amount. People like this idea of modeling serendipity in the computational context. However, um, as you can see here, it's been submitted to a bunch of journals and had a bunch of basically rejections. Sometimes revise and resubmit, sometimes a little bit more um, interesting, like decline to review or just straight up reject. But anyway, um, yeah, it's it's uh, every time we get quite optimistic then our dreams are crushed. So what's the point of carrying on under these circumstances? Maybe we should just give up, but we can decide that the paper or indeed the whole topic of serendipity, uh, modeling serendipity in a, model, in a computational context perhaps is, is a cursed topic or doubt that we have anything worthwhile to say about it or whether we have the capability to write a good topic of serendipity in the field of computer science. Maybe it's just a bad fit. Or maybe we just haven't found the right audience. Maybe we haven't found the right audience until today at this very moment. Certainly preparing for this talk has motivated me to look again at the material. Um, so today, yeah, we're looking into serendipity to know more about serendipity. So this is indeed partly planned and we're getting back to the metal detector metaphor of mining through all of that old material and seeing, is there anything good in there? Is there anything interesting there? Um, and maybe even more interestingly, thinking about what went wrong. So um, just because we don't have time to go through the whole preprint, uh, one, of, one of which of its characteristics is it's quite long in most of those versions. Uh, here's a high level outline of, of what we talked about. So obviously an introduction, we talked about the structure of serendipitous occurrences, distilling that from literature. Um, then we presented something we, we termed a computational model and evaluation framework for assessing the potential of serendipity in computational systems, which we then tried to apply to look at some examples, um, including two systems, which were discovery systems uh, called HR and HRF. And then we wrapped it all up. So that's a high level outline. And just in a little bit more detail, um, I won't read all of this, but these are surfacing some of the, the things that we talked about. So again, the process model, was important. Um, it has several steps inside. Uh, we define the model's component terms in terms of primitive notions, foundations, and heuristics. There I've listed the systems that we looked at alongside the HRHRL ones I, I mentioned already. Um, and, and yeah, so 
this seemed okay in a sense. Um, and here's something in there that I think everyone had recognized is quite innocuous and, and maybe somewhat worthwhile. Serendipity is dot, dot, dot. Oops, this shouldn't say feedback loops though. This is a copy paste error. So uh, yeah, so what is serendipity uh, from the literature? Um, okay, so yeah, so uh, maybe it's funny in terms of a feedback loop. Actually, this is kind of a recursive, um, a recursive uh, unpacking of it from, I guess, line two is maybe the more um, original one, chance encountering of information plus sagacity to derive insight. But different people, discovery of an invention, perhaps, um, three-part formulations, four-part formulations, um, a nice articulated uh, six-part one. And we, I don't know if this was a great of great value. We just sort of tried to align those terms and we came up with our own six part uh, thing in, in line nine, but maybe we could have just used the one in, in line seven. That's, that's just fine. Um, all of these are just, uh, you know, what's going on in the literature. So that's, that's nice. I, I don't think anyone objected to this part. Um, now here is a big page, which again, I won't have time to read all of them but I might have time to, to, to stop and think and, and talk with you about some of the key ones. Um, here's a big page of extracts. Um, uh, these were the ones that I tagged. And, and just real briefly, I've surfaced, these are the reviews. So let's just take mine, the machines. So in here, I've, I've highlighted the key terms from, from these reviews. Uh, the additional factors whose status are not totally clear. And then if I go in here, these are little my little annotations on the annotations um, that expand this. So you know, many people observe the paper is very long, and they basically hate that. It takes up a bunch of time, and they wonder if it's very substantial. So, um, you know, rather than celebrating the amazing things of the paper, um, this this process is about really investigating all of the things that are wrong with the paper. Uh, kind of embracing uh, Zembla and, 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 and rather than serendip here and thinking about what are all the flaws. So to kind of sum that up, um, especially because I'm running low on time, um, one of the things that I think is a real flaw um, is, is this notion of a, of a process model. Um, here you can see here that the, the process model is kind of perception of a chance event, attention to salient detail, focus shift to, uh, achieved through interest, explanation of the event and then bridging to a problem and valuation of the result. And there's nothing wrong with this per se as a, as a description of a kind of process. But the first, the first flaw, which I think should come to mind given what I just said in the first part of this talk, is that this isn't a loop really. I mean, yes, you get a result out at the end, but it really is just a linear process. You, you, you start here with an event and you get out a result. And that's, that seems quite, even though it's perhaps descriptive in some way, it's empirically pretty lousy because then if you look at this, what you get is a kind of checklist type of model. Like, did they perceive something? Uh, you know, a tree in the desert. Um, here, the strange tree in the desert. Why is the tree in the desert? Well, okay, look, there was a, there was a dripping tap actually. Hmm, well, the drip, dripping tap is interesting. What, what about this dripping tap could be interesting? Maybe, maybe the dripping tap, you know, uh, is what made this tree flourish in the desert. What other things now could we solve with dripping things in the middle of the desert? Oh, well, we could invent a, a way to irrigate plants in the desert based on this. So, so yeah, so it, we can follow this through line probably in any given example, but it doesn't seem that we get a whole lot of, of insights perhaps from this. So um, maybe what's more interesting, I think, I think this is the paper itself, uh, if we look at this table, these were a bunch of heuristics that we pulled out. Um, some of them may, you know, they haven't been defined very much, but there's a much longer list of them. And these could be turned into, although it hasn't been done, uh, they could be turned into uh, some kind of design principles. Like experiments can give surprising results. That, that's a pretty bland or kind of innocuous statement, but, you know, um, if applied as a design principle to building some kind of system of some form, um, you know, you might say, okay, well, when should we when should we try an experiment? Maybe maybe an experiment in the context of this paper could be talking to somebody about the paper for five minutes um, and finding out, wow, they they had really completely different things to say about it than I uh, than I thought of. So 
anyway, so that's one of my one of my comments here. Just it, I, again, I don't have a great deal of time to go into all of these reviewer comments, but that one, the fact that it's a kind of linear checklist model is 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 uh, bad. And then the other thing that they found a bit um, disturbing, I think, is is the lack of distinction between the literature and any kind of new substantial insight. So indeed, the whole paper as a whole could be used, uh, could be thought of as a survey without a great deal of originality in it, um, finding frameworks in the literature, applying those then and looking at um, existing uh, concepts in the literature, which kind of align with the, the framework that we had and saying, yeah, this is all out there. And, and look, here's also some existing systems that um, we can analyze in terms of our model. And that's all well and good really, but it's not very original. Um, and then, so the question is what, if anything, really did we learn from that process? So I think those are two takeaway points uh, from that. So uh, as, I, as I haven't got a great deal of time, let's, let's uh, briefly re-outline the paper. So we've talked about this already today, serendipity, what is it and why should we care? So actually in terms of computational thinking, um, these are serious issues. We've got the issue of getting stuck in local minima in many computational processes. And this is why, by the way, Kenneth Stanley was saying, you can't find something for looking because if you look, then you're bound to get stuck in a, in a series of local optima. And so this is theorized and relevant and when one could explore it uh, more is ongoing work inside the field of computation. As I've said today, we could relate the concept of serendipity to concepts in adaptivity and evolution, um, and in, in particular, evolutionary computing. I showed some examples. Um, we could present a unified treatment of serendipity as a service and serendipity in the system, which was something we kind of introduced in our, in our paper, but we used the serendipity as a service as a kind of throwaway concept uh, in order to set up the idea of, of modeling serendipity in the system. But actually it might be more interesting to look at serendipity as a phenomenon of interaction between certain systems and certain um, other systems, certain systems and certain other components. So you know, my ability to interact with a person, as I, as I mentioned in that little example of having a surprising conversation with them, um, that's got two, two agents and one conversation, let's say. Um, shouldn't we be able to model that as a loop? And if it was a loop, you know, maybe that one of those agents or two of the agents could be replaced with uh, computers or computer programs. And then, as I mentioned uh, before, putting it in terms of design patterns rather than definitions um, would give us more to say. And that's all kind of the part one, really, what part one could look like of this kind of paper. Like, what is it? Um, then we might exemplify it with some plausible reason implemented examples rather than this kind of chase through history to find these sort of weird examples which seem she shoehorned but rather take you know the best possible example which might be work by Kenneth Stanley who's based at OpenAI and all and he's been talking about why greatness cannot be planned take that and just try to describe it using our models to bring in some sense of plausibility to having computing in some kind of computational context whether it's with humans in the loop or not evolutionary or not here it is and, and you know this really exists and we can talk about it using the terms that, that we've gathered and then finally i think what would really make this all light on fire for people would be to exemplify it and gain some new insights with with a new implementation and in fact the this brings me to the conclusions um how did we all get started with this um in particular, it's a hard task for autonomous computational systems to tackle the combinatorial explosion of potential combinations and to be capable of recognizing the value of newly created ideas, concepts, theory, solutions, et cetera, particularly when they're not specifically thought, sought. So this is the problem of creative serendipitous behavior. Basically in this project that I was employed on, we promised to deliver a system that could do serendipitous discovery, um, but that set us uh, on a kind of recursive path to figure out what exactly the heck we were talking about, and that today I've presented, um, you know, to the best of my ability, what that what that might be, what it would might mean to build a system that could exhibit this behavior. Um, but yeah, they they made the uh, tactical uh, error of promising to deliver it, so so that was difficult. Um, anyway, if we quote our own um, preprint, um, 
While Copeland suggests that serendipity is a category that can only be applied retrospectively to a discovery process, she also mentions several skills and cultural traits that can be cultivated to encourage serendipity, such as the early sharing of research results. And, and I will stand by that despite the difficulties and ups and downs that I shared with you. It's great to be here in a room you know, with key experts in serendipity and having been invited to come talk about it. Um, so, you know, something's working here, even if the paper as a whole is a bit failed. So let, let's just kind of resummarize the talk. So I think that adaptivity helps put this on a good foundation, which surprising to me puts us in the direction of theoretical biology, which I hadn't really thought of in connection with this work until I started working in the talk. Um, I've also, I think at least elusively showed you that the writing process shouldn't be ignored as we think about serendipity. Um, Engagement with reviewers uh, is helpful. I mean, engaging with my co-authors and colleagues is clearly uh, at least helpful to get us to the current point, but engaging with reviewers is tremendously helpful. And that, that kind of brings to mind this broader context and the, and the relationship with the broader context that I was alluding to. Um, I have to thank you all uh, for being interested peers to invite me along and, and I look forward to the discussion. And um, as, as I mentioned, the revisions are still to be done, but I, I, I do see this work as having significantly empowered me to do that work. Um, and on that basis, yeah, I would just give an acknowledgement to Spinoza and Deleuze for pointing out um, you know, the whole notion of affectivity and empowerment as, as key issues to bring to this work. So that's it from me now in terms of talking.